So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, whose name we've already heard a couple of times tonight, Dr. Peter Webley. Uh, Peter has been a faculty member with the Geophysical Institute in the Remote Sensing Group for 10 years, is that correct? After finishing a postdoc here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And during that time, he's been one of our most prolific researchers. Uh, he's been the lead investigator on about 15 different projects from numerous different agencies. And as we already heard earlier tonight from Dan, uh, he's the co-founder of one of, of the first company that uh, was spun out of the University of Alaska, Fairbanks Viadept. And so I think he'll be talking a little bit more about that. But first, I have to tease Peter a little bit because I think he didn't get the memo about this TED Talk style format because you have to look at the title that he has here. So I'm just going to make sure I get this right here, Peter. I got to read this here. I couldn't memorize this part. Preparing the next generation, developing new decision support capabilities, and integrating hazard detection and assessment research with the training of emergency management personnel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so can you tell us what that's about? Of course. Thank you. So thank you, Gwen. Um, I'm going to try the pointer. So let's see if we can get this to work. I'll move over to the left so I can point it at the computer. There we go. Preparedness is the key. So Gwen gave a beautiful introduction to my talk. Um, but when I go through these talks, I'm, I'm a scientist. And I like to long words and I like long sentences. Um, I'm also a Brit, so I like to expand and describe things in intricate detail. <laughs> but for a TED talk, I thought, well, maybe I should shorten it. So I went for preparedness is the key um, <laughs> to make it um, easier to grab and a take-home message for you today. So what does being prepared mean? Um, for those that have grown up, it's, I'm not going to be talking about the scout movement. Um, for those that are sports fans, I'm not going to be talking about Deflategate and preparing to know what your opposition is. Um, I'm also not going to be talking about how much food you need in your uh, cabin for the apocalypse. I'm going to be talking about hazards and how we need to be prepared about hazards. We need to understand the hazard, but before we need to understand the hazard, we need to understand its potential impact. Because unless we are prepared to of what it's going to do, then we aren't ready for when it actually occurs. And the final output of this is, point of it to the computer, is, <laughs> I'm back, developing exercises. We're not talking about yoga, we're not talking about Pilates, we're talking about what are called tabletop exercises where you're actually put in the middle of an event. So when the event occurs for real, you're not learning the process. So why do we do this at UAF? Well, we have world-leading hazard researchers. I'm one of those. But we need to get the hazard knowledge in the hands of the people that are going to be dealing with it on the front line. So we have an emergency management group. This has now got over 200 students. Five years ago, it had five. This is a growing group at this university. And we bring all of this together. And we have a center for this. And I thought about putting up the full title of the center. However, I probably fill the whole slide with the description. Again, I like using long words to describe things. But I'm a scientist. All scientists like acronyms. If you ever speak to anybody that works in the National Weather Service and listen to one of their conversations, it's acronym after acronym after acronym, and it takes half an hour to explain the description. So we thought, let's bring up a snazzy title, C Sharp. It's not for those who are in music, it's not the, the letter, but it's a snazzy way for us to bring everything together. So we're C Sharp, I'm the deputy director. So what do we do? Well, we perform training. That's the first aspect of what we do. And we do that at both, both a graduate level undergraduate level and on-the-job training. You always need to be learning. It's why I'm an academic. It's why we do it at the university. This slide you see here is just a few examples of what we've done at the university to train the next generation. We do this through student exercises. We also link with FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency to bring their training exercises into the state of Alaska. And for those interested, coming in December, we are bringing 
the experts to come and provide a course on disaster awareness for community leaders. How community leaders can then be the point of contact for emergency personnel, for if called in the National Guard, and if declared a status of emergency, FEMA, when there's an actual disaster event. So, we want to detect the hazard. How do we do that? We use satellite data. Alaska is a massive state. For those that don't know, we heard earlier about putting, from President Johnson, putting the state over the US and it would go from the west to the east coast. Well, actually, Alaska is the most western, eastern, and northern state of the United States because it crosses the date line. It goes over and across the uh, 180 degrees. Here's an example of where satellite data is useful. This is the ice jam at Galena. Image before, image afterwards. We see the flooding. Using this data, combining them, the data sets together, we can detect the hazard from anywhere across the state of Alaska and even across the whole of the Arctic region quickly, effectively. But, as I said earlier, what's the potential impact? Well, to do that, we need to understand what it could do, and we need to run lots of what we call what-if scenarios. Um, what-if scenarios are the volcano. I'm a volcano scientist, and as Senator Mikowski said, there's a lot of in interest, potentially, in, in the impact of volcanoes across the Arctic. The top image is a volcano in Alaska, the potential of what that could, ash, that that could have on the local region. The brighter the color, the more potential of an event impacting that region. The bottom is an actual event from that volcano. We see that the potential impact was mainly to the east, with some going down to the southeast. So you're thinking, oh, well, how accurate is that? The bottom image is a satellite data of that event. And I'll move over to the right so everybody can see it, apart from my pre other presenters, and I'm now going to block it out for them. Um, this is the actual ash cloud. For those that do not know the region, if you put um, uh, Iceland here, this would be Greece. So this is about 2,000 kilometers. And there was a mention earlier from Dan White about the impact of the volcano in Iceland on Europe called Eyjafjallajökull. And you may think that's pretty impressive for a Brit to be able to explain the name of an Icelandic volcano. <laughs> However, the volcano erupted in 2010. It's now 2015. And it's taken me about five years of practice to be able to say the name of that volcano. Also, I have personal experience. I was stuck in, in England because of the eruption. There was a decision made to close the airspace by the authorities. And I was stuck at my mum's house on holiday. <laughs> ironic for a volcanologist. And I'm like, great, I need to get back to Alaska. How am I going to do it? Well, I call up British Airways, and the lady on the phone says, oh, hello, sir. Yes, you're looking for a change of flight. Uh, we can uh, send you out on Saturday. And I'm like, no, thank you. And for about 30 seconds, you could hear her at the other end going, what? You don't want to leave on the date I'm offering you? I said, nope. I want to leave the following Saturday. Please, can I have a flight then? She said, yes, plenty of space. Nobody's choosing that date. And she probably put the phone down and thought, oh, weird. Oh, he's decided to fly like a week later. What does he want to do? Sit around and not get paid, go out to his job. He just wants to take a break. What I'd actually done is I'd done a bit of research. Being a volcanologist, I'd done some preparation. I'd ran some of my capabilities in Alaska from the computer at my mum's house to tell me that if the volcano continued to erupt, the airspace would still be closed on that Saturday. So I prepared myself that that would be the date I could not fly home. They keep the, air, the airspace closed until the Tuesday. I would have been stuck in England. So I, I, I was prepared. So what are some of the tools that can be used for that? Well, web-based data. Um, the internet is advancing with, in leaps and bounds every day. And th these are some of the tools that we've developed that uh, Dr. Dan White mentioned, where, as a company, we have what's called a public-private partnership with the university. We build capacity. I can get my phone out of my pocket 
And if I had connection to the Wi-Fi here, because the cell phone reception is rubbish in the, uh, out at the Blue Loon, <laughs> but if I had connection to the Wi-Fi, this data, I could run it on my phone right now in front of you. Those living in Alaska will know 40 below is horrible to go out in. Takes you about 10 minutes to get your winter gear on. If you forgot to plug your car in, forget it. You're not driving anywhere. These tools can be checked from your bed. I can do this, and I can make a phone call about what we're seeing without actually having to get out of the bedroom. When it's happening at 2 o'clock in the morning, in the middle of December, that is a great advantage. You can make a decision quickly without all the other stress of having to drive to the office. So these tools can be really useful during a, a crisis event. So, how do we prepare? One example is we work with those that are going to have to deal with the hazard. Here we see actually a NATO parliamentary committee coming to the university to work with us. And you may think, well, why is that? We have these, Jeremy mentioned, subject matter experts. It's the group of people that, that have the expertise in that hazard that can be brought into the room to help the decision makers, to help the emergency personnel. This is the new head adjunct general of the National Guard. She came to Fairbanks with her personnel within about a month or so of her starting to work with us to help her group if they're ever called in for a natural, event, natural disaster event in the state of Alaska. So there's experts here at the university that can help. Could we get to the end of this slide, please, Marsha? Just three clicks. So we work in threes. You, 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 you all, we, we all know about the team Google or the company Google. Well, they work in threes. Threes are useful. You want to have threes. You can always potentially have a, a, a person that can make the decision. Uh, we work in threes in terms of what we do for preparedness. There's data. We want to use that data to detect. There's data to prepare and analyze, but then we also want to practice. So practice, practice, practice. What could happen, what events we could run, what scenarios we could go with, and how we can engage the public. Today, you're listening to just part of that. This is part of our engagement, this part of our practice, giving you the information so you can take it home and go, oh, hazards, how could they impact my energy needs? How could they impact my transportation needs? How do I want to be prepared for the next event? And the last slide before I bring everything back together is, what are some of the hazards? Forest fires. These are the funny river fire from 2014, where not only was it an impact to property, it also caused impacts to the transportation needs of the whole of the Kenai Peninsula. So if you lived in Homer, your transportation needs were impacted from a fire several, hundred, several maybe 100 kilometers away. The top image, Drift River Oil Terminal. This was impacted during the 2009 eruption of Redoubt. If that had had oil in it and it had gone into the Cook Inlet, it would have been about half the size of the Exxon Valdez. The last one, for those from Iceland and from Europe, they may recognize this. This is AF Yellow Yokel Volcano, where ash was forecasted and detected as far, as, as far away as Germany from Iceland, just like an eruption in Alaska impacting Houston. So my final thoughts, my final statements, what you should take home tonight is working together. My original statement, preparedness is the key. But to be prepared, the only way we can be prepared is to work together. Individually, we won't get there. Working as a team, we will. Training the next generation. Some of us in the room may be retired from our jobs. Some of us may want to be retired from our jobs. But we eventually all will be retired. We'll all leave our work. The next people coming through need to be trained so they can do the job and prepare their next generation. And the only way we can do that is through training and education. And by working together, we can become better 
and have a better place to leave the next generation. So thank you, and I will put that down, and thank you very much.